you want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. The saints, and the cross the nation, that it's a sex, the God, the freaks, the fraud, the Welcome back to Reliving the War. We have a true landmark episode this week. Many would consider May 27th, 1996 the true beginning of the Monday Night Wars, so this should be a fun episode. Nitro goes into a two hour format from this point onwards. I'm going to cover the first hour of Nitro and I'll also decide if I would have switched over to Raw or stuck with Nitro when the WWF show came on the air. If I stick with Nitro, a point is given to WCW. If Nitro wasn't all that captivating, then Raw gets the point. Before we look at Nitro's first 60 minutes though, we have to look at the In Your House Beware of Dog results, so let's do that first. In Your House Beware of Dog was originally scheduled to be held on May 26th, but a thunderstorm caused the lights in the arena to go out and the pay-per-view feed got cut. Only two matches were shown on the original pay-per-view along with a few dark matches, so the event was rescheduled as Beware of Dog 2 and that show took place on the 28th of May during the Superstars tapings. The subsequent video releases of Beware of Dog contained matches from both shows and to avoid confusion, I'll just use the WWE Network version to go through the results. Mark Merrow defeated Hunter Hearst Helmsley in the opening match of Beware of Dog 1 and then the lights went out during the Savio Vega vs Steve Austin strap match. The power was restored in time for the Shawn Michaels vs Davey Boy Smith match but you can just tell that neither man was very happy with how this whole thing was turning out. Shawn Michaels in particular didn't look very thrilled. Clarence Mason served papers to Sean before the bout. The charge was an attempted alienation of affection due to the allegations of Sean trying to do the dirty with Davy's wife, but this was all a ploy to throw Sean off his game. The match ended in a draw when Michaels performed a German suplex into a pinning combination. Both competitors' shoulders were on the mat, so HBK left Beware of Dogs, still the WWF champion, though this does mean that the Sean Michaels and Davy Boy Smith rivalry is going to continue. We then move over to Beware of Dog 2 and the Caribbean strap match between Savio Vega and Steve Austin. Savio won the match. Because of Steve Austin's defeat, Ted DiBiase had to leave the WWF, but in reality, DiBiase was going to WCW, and this allowed Steve Austin to begin his true stone cold run in the WWF. Vader then defeated Yokozuna, and what's curious here is that Yokozuna actually got the win at Beware of Dog 1. Vader won the match with the Vader bomb. The final match on the video presentation was the Goldust vs Undertaker casket match. Goldust successfully retained his IC title here after Mankind appeared from the casket. The Undertaker took the mandible claw and Mankind closed the lid to end the match. When the casket was opened up afterwards, the Undertaker had disappeared. In the end, Beware of Dog was a mess, but credit to the WWF here for trying to make things right with another show two nights later. It was reported that Vince McMahon didn't freak out about the power outage either, he just sat at the commentary table with the attitude of, it is what it is. The two combined shows aren't great though if I'm honest, it's one of the weaker 1996 pay-per-views from the WWF. Okay, so now let's go over the first hour of Nitro that aired the following night. WCW Monday Nitro is live from Macon, Georgia. Tony Schiavone and Larry Zbysko are going to call the action during the first 60 minutes, while Bobby Heenan and Eric Bischoff will take over for hour two. Schiavone and Zbysko let us know that we're going to see Sting vs Scott Steiner tonight and we also have a world title match, The Shark vs The Giant. The American Males took on Ric Flair and Arn Anderson in our opening match, and this one was actually 
really fun. Flair's VIP section was set up at ringside and Woman even brought some drinks over to Shivani and Sabisco. Inside the ring the American males bumped around the ring for Flair and Double A. Referee Randy Anderson got a little frisky with Ric Flair and the Nature Boys sold for Randy like a champion. The audience loved this spot. In the end a DDT from the Enforcer led to Bagwell getting pinned by Slick Rick. A good opening match here for Monday Nitro. After the bout we got an interview with the Horseman. Flair promotes the upcoming Great American Bash tag team match pitting Anderson and himself against Kevin Green and Steve McMichael. And we also got to see Mongo and Green training for the big tag team match. This training video was unintentionally hilarious. You've got Mongo and Green psyching each other up while grunting and growling. Pretty sure this would have made the Horseman laugh instead of feel any kind of threat. We then have another match inside the ring. It's the Mauler vs Steve Dahl. Steve Dahl you may remember better as Stephen Dunn from the Well Done tag team in the WWF and the Mauler is better known by his real name, Mike Enos. He was also known as Blake Beverly during his days in the WWF as one half of the Beverly Brothers. But I know you don't care about that. You care about the guy who showed up from the audience to interrupt this match. The crowd is absolutely stunned as the WWF's Razor Ramon shows up on Monday Nitro. Razor asks for a microphone, the match stops dead, and the bad guy gets in the ring to cut one of the most important promos of the Monday Night War. Razor Ramon isn't given a name, he isn't referred to as Razor by the commentary team, he isn't even called Scott Hall. As far as we know, this is the World Wrestling Federation's Razor Ramon interrupting a WCW event, and this is exactly what Eric Bischoff was trying to portray. Scott Hall had, in reality, signed with World Championship Wrestling, but he played the role of a WWF invader and he also played the role of Razor Ramon without being called Razor Ramon. This would be something WCW would be forced to legally clear up in the weeks that followed. Anyway, Hall says, Hey, you people, you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. Where is Billionaire Ted? Where is the Nacho Man? That punk can't even get in the building. Me, I go wherever I want, whenever I want. And where oh where is Scheme Jean? Cause I got a scoop for you. When that Ken doll lookalike, when that weatherman wannabe comes out here later tonight, I got a challenge for him, for Billionaire Ted, for the Nacho Man, and for anybody else in WCW. You, you wanna, wanna go, go to, to war? war? You wanna war? You're gonna get one. Scott Hall was using the derogatory names for Ted Turner, Mean Gene Okerlund and Randy Savage that the WWF made up during their old Billionaire Ted skits. This again was to try and show that Scott was a WWF guy trying to start a fight with WCW. Hall had also said he had a challenge for Eric Bischoff later in the show. Zabisco and Shivani are completely lost for words as Hall leaves the ringside area. The audience try to process what they just saw as evidence by the strange hush inside the arena. This was pulled off so well. Razor Ramon was one of the most popular stars the WWF had. It would have been so easy to have Hall return to WCW with a pay per view match and book him as a standard babyface, but Bischoff gambled on this invasion storyline and already it seemed way more interesting than anything the WWF had going on. I mean, do you want to watch Diana Hart getting restraining orders against Shawn Michaels, or do you want to see a WWF? guy declaring war on the opposing channel. Absolutely brilliant work here from WCW. Diamond Dallas Page took on Sergeant Craig Pittman next. The two men had a little press up challenge before the match and it ended with DDP taking a spectacular back bump when he tried to kick his opponent. DDP ended up scoring the win with the diamond cutter. After the match it was announced that Randy Savage had been suspended for his failure to control himself recently at WCW shows. Savage had been arrested one too many times for crimes against the four horsemen, I don't know. 
The shark has been kicked out of the Dungeon of Doom apparently and he's looking forward to winning the world title later on Nitro. Something tells me that that isn't going to happen. From the coolness of Scott Hall to the comically bad shark character, it's clear to see WCW still had a lot of work to do. It's not like the NWO angle fixed all of WCW's problems overnight. The first 60 minutes is coming to an end. We see a video with Hulk Hogan hanging out with celebrities. George Foreman, Sugar Ray Leonard, Dennis Rodman, Kevin Green. Not sure what this was trying to prove, but yeah, the Hulkster has friends in high places it seems. The Giant then defeated the Shark in a very, very predictable match. The Shark hits a clothesline from the middle rope, but Jimmy Hart jumped on the apron to cause a distraction. The Shark then takes the choke slam, and the Giant leaves, still the WCW champion. Champion. Big Bubba showed up after the match and he shaved the shark's head. Bubba was apparently sent to the ring by Kevin Sullivan. Nitro gets the first point. I absolutely would have stuck with Nitro here just to see what Scott Hall was going to do later in the show. Right, now we can compare Raw and Nitro, this is fucking crazy. Raw is live tonight from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Goldust is already in the ring waiting for his opponent, the Ultimate Warrior. While WCW presents a TV title match, champion Lex Luger defending against... Uh Max. The Warrior gets an incredible pop on his way to the ring. This is a King of the Ring qualifying match too, by the way. The WWF will present the King of the Ring pay-per-view on the 23rd of June. Goldust stalls on the outside. The Warrior gives chase and when both competitors eventually get in the ring, the Ultimate Warrior dominates his opponent. Two atomic drops result in Goldust getting sent back outside the ring and Vince McMahon begins apologising for the Beware of Dog fiasco on commentary. Remember, Beware of Dog 2 hadn't happened yet, it would take place the day after this episode of Nitro, as if this episode of Reliving the War wasn't convoluted enough. Goldust tries to get in some offence, but Warrior decides to dance instead, good man. Goldust again finds himself on the outside, where Warrior dumps the bizarre one over the guardrail. Goldust tries to return the favour, but there's no way the Warrior is taking that same bump. Warrior no-sells it, he rams Goldust's head into the ring post, and the onslaught continues inside the ring. Goldust is finally able to take control as McMahon begins promoting the Warrior's comic book. Goldust applies a camel clutch, but the Warrior shows his strength by lifting his opponent up and delivering an electric chair drop. Goldust decides he's had enough and he goes to leave the arena, but Ahmed Johnson shows up to bring the Bizarre One back to the ring. We go to commercial break and Goldust ends up once again gaining the upper hand. Warrior is now looking completely blown up as he gets sent to the outside, crashing through Marlena's chair in the process, but this spot was unfortunately missed by the cameras. Goldust tries to target the arm, but Warrior fights back. Warrior hits a back body drop and an uncharacteristic belly-to-belly -belly suplex that actually looked pretty good, but Goldust kicks out of two. Goldust hits a low blow to the little warrior to gain control once again, and it's now time for a rest hold. Honestly, warrior needs it. He's looked quite tired over the last few minutes. A big power slam from the warrior gets a two count. This also looked good. Warrior then begins feeling the power and Goldust takes a few clotheslines, followed by a diving shoulder tackle. And once again, Goldust leaves the ring. The Warrior gives chase this time and the referee calls for the bell. It's a double count out, neither man advances in the King of the Ring. It makes you wonder, why didn't Ahmed Johnson show up again to bring Goldust back into the ring? Jerry Lawler decides he's going to sneak attack the Warrior with the broken chair, but Warrior gives chase. This sets up a Jerry Lawler vs Ultimate Warrior feud that we have the pleasure of watching unfold over the next few weeks. Hooray. Eric Bischoff and Bobby Heenan are now on commentary over on Nitro and Eric says that WCW isn't going to acknowledge that guy who came out earlier, Eric obviously referring to Scott Hall. Lex Luger vs Max then, not Max Power, not Max Steel just Max. Max here did work as Max Muscle previously on WCW secondary shows where he worked as DDP's bodyguard but now he was just plain old Max. He had become a member of the Dungeon of Doom eventually but there's a reason why no one can recall his membership. It was completely forgettable. Something becomes apparent here though as Lex Luger makes his way down to the ring. WCW were wasting time by making entrances a little longer. This would become more and more evident as the weeks went 
went on, the NWO in particular could take two or three minutes to walk a 20 foot entranceway. Even after the bell rings, it's more stalling and more time wasting, Luger plays up to the crowd, Max shoves Luger into the corner, and the two men let the clock tick away as they circle the ring before locking up again. Max overpowers the total package once more, and yeah, you can see where this is going here. Luger begins firing back with clotheslines, but Max stops the total package with a power slam. The Ultimate Warriors looked way better. We don't see it, but Scott Hall tries to approach Eric Bischoff at the commentary table. We do hear Bischoff telling someone that Hall has to wait until the end of the show if he wants to speak again. A great way to keep people hooked in during this abysmal matchup inside the ring. Max is taking care of Luger. Luger gets a boot up in the corner and he hits the bionic forearm. Luger then hits a power slam and and again, somehow the Ultimate Warriors looked better. There's a bit of a struggle when applying the torture rack, but Luger locks it in, and Luger leaves WCW Nitro still the TV champion. And giving the point to Goldust versus the Ultimate Warrior, the Nitro match was an absolute snooze fest. Mean Gene interviews Luger afterwards. Gene reminds Luger that the giant choke slammed him through a table a few weeks back. Luger says he'll get revenge at the Great American Bash, and Luger says he wants to take on every big man WCW has to offer on his way to the pay-per-view. Hard work Bobby Walker takes on Brad Armstrong next on Nitro, while Vince McMahon talks about Beware of Dog on Raw and we also get a Ted DiBiase and Steve Austin promo. We see clips from the Beware of Dog free for all. Sonny came out with the new tag team champions, the Godwins, but during their match with the smoking guns, Billy Gunn kissed Sonny. This caused Phineas to get distracted and the guns became the new tag team champions. Vince then talks about the lights going out in the arena. McMahon says, Mother Nature played a cold trick on the World Wrestling Federation, and he invites fans to call their local cable company if they want refunds. But the WWF want to make things right with Beware of Dog 2. The casket match, the Vader vs Yokozuna match, and the Caribbean strap match will all get redone the next night live on pay per view. Ted DiBiase says he's not happy at all with this. Vega won the strap match the night before, but DiBiase says there's no way of telling who truly won the match seeing as the lights went out in the arena. DiBiase is confident that Austin will win in the Beware of Dog 2 rematch, and if Austin loses, DiBiase says he'll leave the World Wrestling Federation. We already know what happened here. Interesting stuff though, unique circumstances led to Vince McMahon pretty much apologising for something that was out of his control. Not sure if it makes for riveting TV, but it's still pretty interesting. Brad Armstrong vs Hard Work Bobby Walker, hard work indeed. Bobby Walker had been in WCW since 1992, even though the commentators call him a rookie here, and he even had a brief stint in the World Wrestling Federation all the way back in 1991. His early career was plagued with injuries, he eventually became a WCW job guy, but he got a near 8 year stretch out of World Championship Wrestling. His body transformation over the years was truly insane too. Anyway, it's a throwaway match here, something that Brad Armstrong was becoming accustomed to, and it's a real shame also. I've said this a few times, but Armstrong is one of wrestling's true underrated performers in every sense of the word, and he deserved more than what he got. This was booked as a cruiserweight match. Bischoff uses this bout to once again put over the appearance of Scott Hall, and Eric says he will not say Scott's name, real name nor gimmick name, due to the fact that there could be legal ramifications for doing so. People to this day say that Scott Hall was not positioned as a WWF invader when he came to WCW, and I really don't know what to say to these people except they really need to watch the whole Nitro broadcast to see how Scott was getting reintroduced to WCW audiences. It's as clear as day, Razor Ramon had showed up and declared war on WCW while acting like he was still part of the WWF. It wasn't until the World Wrestling Federation began filing legal papers that WCW decided to formally announce that Hall was not employed by the World Wrestling Federation. Hard work Bobby Walker loses his footing a few times here, as Eric Bischoff says that a newcomer by the name of Rey Mysterio Jr. is going to challenge Dean Malenko at the Great American Bash. The match slows down on the mat, Armstrong fights his way out of the head scissors, and then hard work Bobby Walker again
Ian loses his balance on the top rope and he completely misses a diving neckbreaker. More like botchy work Bobby Walker. What's more, Walker wins with this move. I'm sure there were some harsh words shared backstage after this one. No points for Raw or Nitro here. There was nothing good from neither show I'm afraid. Lord Steven Regal takes on Dad's Wunderkind Alex Wright on Nitro, while the WWF presents Tag Team Champions The Smoking Guns vs The Body Donnas. Sunny is now in the corner of Billy and Bart, so she's been with three tag teams, six guys, over the course of a week. Hillbilly Jim is providing commentary. It's announced that the Godwins will get a rematch against The Smoking Guns at the King of the Ring. Hillbilly Jim says that Phineas is under Sunny's spell, and does anyone really give a shit about any of this? I mean, the body Bonnie Donners are the ones who got robbed here. Billy Gunn comes back from injury and somehow the smoking guns get the belts back immediately and they also get Sonny. Zip and Skip were doing all the work inside the ring these past lot of weeks and now they're playing second fiddle to both the smoking guns and the Godwins. Would that mean they're playing third fiddle? Anyway, Zip and Bart Gunn trade knife edge chops to start the match off. Harvey Whippleman is once again at the entranceway taking notes on the WWF's poor officiating as of late. Bart takes control before the smoking guns begin making quick tags. Bart hits a press slam before Billy and Skip come into the match and yeah, these two worked extremely well against each other. We see a good fast paced sequence as Skip hits a flying head scissors and Billy hits a back body drop. Billy also hits a clothesline from an arm drag counter, so yeah, good stuff here. Skip confronts Sonny on the outside as we go to commercial break, and when we come back, Zip takes Bart out of the ring and he lays a beating in on the outside. The body donners then take control of the match and Bart needs to tag out. Zip applies a camel clutch and Skip comes back in to continue the punishment. Sonny cheers on the smoking guns as Phineas Godwin walks down to the ring. Hillbilly Jim and Henry Godwin are attempting to talk sense into Phineas as the hog farmer tries to approach Sonny. And then the three men just leave the ringside area as the match continues. Billy Gunn gets taken out and he gets checked on by Sonny. Bart Gunn takes a beating from Zip and Skip, but he manages to still score the win for his team after reversing a top rope crossbody. Billy wasn't there for Bart of course, and this would kickstart the slow building breakup of the smoking guns. Steve Regal vs Alex Wright sounds interesting over on Nitro. Regal takes Alex down before talking smack to the audience, and Wright performs a one-handed cartwheel reverse wrist lock takedown. I don't know, but it looked pretty impressive. Wright then gets out of a wrist lock with a kip up jump over double kick to the chin. I've no idea, but again, it looked good. Regal gets angry, but Wright stays right on top of his lordship. Regal times out on the outside, but Alex hits a baseball slide followed by a diving crossbody as Nitro takes a commercial break. A video then airs that says our world is about to change as a giant portal opens up while frosting up the screen. The word glacier appears and whoever or whatever this is, it's coming to WCW and I can't wait to find out more next week. We go back to our match and Alex is still in control. Regal gets a break after delivering a thumb to the eye. Alex tries to fight back but Regal delivers a drop toe hold resulting in Alex eating the mat for a little while. Wright reverses a European uppercut with a belt belly to belly suplex, but it isn't enough to slow down Lord Steven Regal. Bischoff is still talking about that WWF guy who showed up earlier. Eric says there was no need for Hall to make fun of Randy Savage and Mean Gene Okerlund, and Eric once again says that Scott Hall will have a chance to speak later if he wants. Alex comes back with a big European uppercut of his own. He flips over Regal in the corner but only scores a two count. Alex hits a picture perfect drop kick, and then William Regal scores the win after slamming Alex to the the mat when Wright went for a monkey flip. Both matches were good here but Nitro's match was better, give this one a watch. Nobody talks about Regal's promo after this match where he mentions Scott Hall. Regal says that WCW is becoming a joke, there's guys like Randy Savage running around pretending to be a hard man when Regal took out the hardest man in wrestling, Fit Finley, just a few weeks ago. Regal then says we have some guy from another organisation wanting to bring a war to WCW and Regal tells Hall not to forget who's in World Championship Wrestling at the moment. Regal says he isn't going anywhere and he's ready to stand up for himself. Regal wants a shot at the WCW title and in order to get that title shot, he says he's going to start with the man called Sting, so he lays out a challenge. 
Before we get to our main events, the WWF shows clips from the title match at Beware of Dog 1. The Michaels vs Bulldog rematch is then made official for the King of the Ring pay-per-view. Our final matches are Vader vs Ahmed Johnson in a King of the Ring qualifier, and we have Sting vs Scott Steiner. The Sega Saturn presents the Slam of the Week over on Raw, while Nitro was sponsored by PlayStation this week. Kinda fitting, isn't it? The Slam of the Week is the ending of the HBK vs Davy Boy match, so it isn't even a slam. Owen Hart provides commentary for the Johnson vs Vader match. The two big men lock horns, but no one gets the advantage. The lockups, the stare downs, and the posing seems to go on forever, but Vader puts an end to it by spitting on his opponent. This fires Ahmed up, the crowd goes absolutely crazy as Ahmed lays a beating in the Vader, and Johnson gets so fired up that he begins fucking spinning around while delivering kicks. I don't know why, but this made me laugh so much. A thumb to the eye puts an end to this madness, and Vader begins going to work on the Pearl River powerhouse. It doesn't last long though, Ahmed fires back and he sends Vader over the top rope. Vader takes his mask off for some reason while both men are on the outside. Johnson throws Vader back into the ring and Jim Cornette decides to hit Ahmed with his tennis racket. Cornette runs away as we go to commercial break and when we come back Vader is in the driver's seat. Owen Hart says he will win the King of the Ring this year as the action continues in the ring. Hart says there could be some trouble within Camp Cornette if Vader ends up running into the King of Hearts in the tournament. Vader goes for the Vader salt but Ahmed moves out of the way. We see that Jim Cornette is returned to ringside as Ahmed hits a power slam. Warrior definitely wins Power Slam of the Week award. And then Ahmed brings Cornette into the ring. Jim gets thrown into Vader, Ahmed hits a spine buster, but the referee isn't there to count the pinfall. Owen Hart, snakeskin, boots and all, jumps on the top rope and he drives his cast into Ahmed. Owen was faking an injury here and his cast would end up getting used as a weapon during matches. And Vader scores the win. Vader continues on in the King of the Ring tournament. Sting hits up Ric Flair's VIP table to steal some cheesy treats before beginning his match with Scotty Steiner. Scott and Sting trade takedowns to begin the match. Heenan says Sting has the advantage here due to Scott being more experienced in tag team matches, but Steiner is definitely holding his own here at the beginning of the bout. Sting fires back with an explosive dropkick followed by a middle rope back elbow. Scott finds himself on the outside and this gives Sting an opportunity to hit a plancha. Back inside the ring, Scott slows the stinger down with a double underhook powerbomb followed by a belly to belly suplex. Sting rolls out of the ring and Steiner hits a double axe handle from the top rope. Sting kicks out a two back inside the ring and then a big boot in the corner nearly takes Steiner's head off and Heenan can't stop laughing at this spot. Payback comes in the form of an overhead belly to belly suplex from the future Big Papa Pump. Steiner applies an STF as Sting continues to get destroyed in this bout. Steiner then locks in an armbar, but when both men get back to their feet, Sting is able to hit a scorpion death drop. Keep in mind, this wasn't a Sting finisher just yet, neither was it called the scorpion death drop. Sting hits a stinger splash, but he misses the second attempt, resulting in Steiner hitting a dragon suplex. Lex Luger and Rick Steiner then show up as Steiner hits a Samoan drop from the top rope. Scott then signals for the end, he misses a Frankensteiner, and Sting goes for the death lock, but Steiner is too close to the ropes. Scott then goes for a tombstone pile driver, but Sting reverses with a tombstone of his own. This has been a good main event for sure. Both men are spent here. A suplex spot from the apron to the outside goes wrong. Not sure what happened here, but this leads to Lex Luger getting involved. Rick Steiner and Lex begin fighting. The fight finds its way into the ring. Sting and Scott get involved, and the referee throws the match out. It's a no contest. Bocce work Bobby Walker and a bunch of WCW guys try to keep things under control, but it's pandemonium to end Monday Nitro. And we still aren't done yet. Nitro gets another point. We've got a few minutes left on both shows, so let's score the final moments. Ahmed Johnson is out cold after getting hit with Owen's cast. He gets brought backstage on a stretcher, and that's when Goldust makes an appearance. Goldust wants to help Ahmed out, so he gives mouth to mouth to the big man in hopes of waking Ahmed up. Sure enough, it works, but what does Ahmed do? He throws a fit and he goes looking for the man who literally just saved his life. 
Ahmed stumbles down the stairs and he takes it out on poor Bob Holly. Look at Mark Merrow here doing nothing and letting his comrade take a beating. Merrow then snitches and he tells Ahmed where to find Goldust. The better moustached version of Bret Hart blocks the door but Ahmed crashes through Bret 0.1 while taking the door with him. The show goes off the air with Ahmed looking for Goldust as Vince says we just witnessed one of the most disgusting things ever in the history of Monday Night Raw. And I agree, Mark Merrow being a little snitch was terribly disgusting. Over on Nitro, Eric Bischoff is wrapping the show up when Scott Hall comes back. Hall says, we're taking over. Eric asks Scott, who is he referring to? And Hall says, you know who. Scott then tells Eric to go back to Ted Turner and get his three best guys. Scott says a war is coming to WCW but it won't happen on the microphone, it won't happen in the dirt sheets, it'll happen in the ring where it matters. Scott says that he and whoever he represents is coming down to WCW and like it or not they are taking over the company. So Hall has let out a challenge, a three on three challenge but we didn't know who else Scott was bringing with him and we did know if WCW would even accept the match. Eric Bischoff's reactions afterwards were absolutely fantastic. He looks embarrassed, he looks lost for words and he looks a little scared. It's another point for Nitro. Well, Raw only managed to score one point this week, so in a predictable outcome, Nitro wins this week's Reliving the War. This means our overall scores are now 14 points to Raw, 17 points to Nitro, and we've had three ties. In the television ratings, Nitro got the win, a 2.8 to Raw's 2.3. Well, we went well over time today, so thank you for sticking this one out. The Beware of Dog stuff and the Scott Hall stuff made things run a little late this week, but what an important week it was in the Monday Night War. Join me next week and we'll do it all over again as the Monday Night War truly begins heating up. Thank you for watching and take care.